Okay, this video is a sort of preview of coming attractions. Um, we're constantly revising the meter on Matthew 24. And the comment videos, comment 18 was the most recent one posted, are using a very different um, allocation of these red things, which are elisions. Okay? The question in the text, because Matthew is writing it in 30 AD and because of the way he does his dateline meter, is whether or not he's using a Hebraistic pronunciation, okay, for Greek words. Okay, like this is Jesus rather than Iesus. This is Hieru instead of Hieru. Okay, this is Eporueto. Or ep ignore the accent marks, they were not in the original text. Epor eporueto rather than eporueto. Okay. So I'm running out with the assumption that the the yes yeah sounds, anything with an I in front of it, is Hebraistically pronounced because that's how Matthew did his dateline in chapter one. That might not be true, okay? And then Anoninominon, whose um, meter is I'm, I'm still using in the comment, the Matthew 24 comment videos, he's taking a very different set of assumptions about whether they're, the, you know, what's considered a diphthong like that. Or, you know, see, because like he likes to, he wanted to use Crassus there. So he uses Kexelet. Kexelton is what he's doing. So this is a very different timeline. Okay, well it's different by a couple of verses really. And what I'm doing, and it will be coming up in later videos, but I want to show something now because we're now debating something that was in the right scoop about whether Erdogan is really representative of the King of the North in Daniel 11. And of course, Wally Chubot claims he is, and I'm pretty sure he's not. But that doesn't completely rule out the idea that Islam is being forecast there. Because Istanbul is the name of the very same place that used to be Constantinople, and that was started by Constantine, who was a Roman emperor. And Constantine himself named what we call Istanbul New Rome. He didn't name it Constantinople. That was a name given later. So if, if he's calling it New Rome, replete with the same seven hills that are in Revelation 17, then the idea of what constitutes Rome needs to be expanded and rethought. But I'm not, Wally Chubat doesn't know the Greek, or he's not familiar with the timeline usage of meter. So his analysis is coming up short, I think. Not wholly excludable, but short. So now I want to just show you, this is Matthew 24. I want to show you how the meter is talking to Constantine. Okay? You go right here. You have to understand, this is your cumulative total. To get AD, just add 30 to these cumulative totals. So this is, this would be 46 AD at the end, you know, long after Christ is dead. This would be 70 AD when the temple goes down, so it's really pregnant, okay, considering what it's all about, okay. And when you get down here, and just look at the numbers here, just, if you don't know the Greek, just, you know, grab your translation Bible. Because really what I'm focusing on is the numbers. And I'll try to translate as I'm, you know, talking to you here. Okay, right here. 274. You have to add 30 to get to the AD year. Okay, so 274 plus 30 is 304. Now that's a famous year in history. At this time it was prophecy, of course. Christ is talking in 30 AD. But the year 304 in history was when, Const when Diocletian began the persecution of Christians. It's called the Diocletian Persecution. You can Google on that and find it. 
And I did extensive reports on this already when Paul covered the same thing. But Paul's writing actually to sandwich his text to Matthew 24. So Matthew 24 is where we really want to go first. But I didn't know about it until Anoninominon did the meter. And so I redid it. Assuming that that's true, 304 ends right here. Okay? This text is saying that there's going to be, you know, earthquakes and other kinds of nasty things in various places. Okay? And that was true. An earthquake, of course, has more of a meaning than just a physical kind of earthquake. The 304 Diocletian persecution was an earthquake to Christianity. One of the reasons we lack 4th century manuscripts is because Diocletian ordered them all to be rounded up and burnt. Now, it wasn't necessarily Diocletian who was behind that. It could have been his, you know, successor, because Diocletian had what was called a tetrarchy, and he, he wanted to have successors to stabilize Rome and all other stuff. And he adopted a guy named Galerius, and Galerius married Diocletian's own daughter. And Galerius was notorious for being anti-Christian. He, you know, the the, Christ, the early church father write-ups like Eusebius and Lactantius, they they lie a lot. So you can't, you have to sort of, you know, take what they write with a grain of salt. But there really was a persecution by Diocletian. He did more than just persecute Christians in 304. He tried to control the economy with price fixes and other things. It didn't work out too well. At the time he's doing this, Constantine is, as it were, his, like, what do you want to call it, um, his apprentice. Constantine was technically a hostage. His dad was Constantius and ruled over Rome. I mean, um, Britannia, the province, you know, Britain, what we call Britain today, and parts of Gaul. Okay, and Constantine, the son, was with Diocletian, physically with him at the time in order to assure the loyalty of Constantius the dad. Now in 304, this relationship between Constantine, Galerius, and um, Diocletian was getting kind of strained. All right? And Galerius really kind of didn't like Constantine. My suspicion is that Galerius was jealous because Diocletian seemed to favor Constantine. Okay? So this is 304, and here's the period of Constantine's own rise, right in here. Okay, so that would be 274, 274 plus 30 is 304, and then you'll notice that the meter here ends at 283, which is kind of hysterical because 283 was when Const, you know, if you just read that as an AD year, that was when Diocletian first came into power. But 304 plus 9 is 313, which takes you all the way to the Battle of Milvin Bridge and to the, the Edict of Toleration after Constantine beats Maxenius' son in Rome. In Rome. Diocletian had already retired. He will retire the year following this. See, this is 274. Okay, technically he retires, 274 is really 304. Technically, Diocletian retired the following year. He got sick at the end of 304. Ends up recovering and, and retires the following year, just like he promised he would do 20 years after he took power. Okay, formal power. That's not the same as when he accounts his own power, which he accounted to 283 AD in his own, his own memoirs. Okay, so you got that, 305 is when he formally retired, during the following three years, so that's panta de, does a transitional particle, so this is a very clever, clever satire. At that point of the duh, Constantine makes the transition and escapes supposedly on horseback, going all the way up to his dad who allegedly was dying up in Britain. And he takes over from his dad and starts this, 
you know, funky, I'm going to take over Rome claim. And in 310 AD, he got the troops to align with him because he said he got a vision of Apollo promising him 120 years of uh, future, you know, victorious reign if he attacked Rome. Two years later, he's going to make that same claim, only it's going to be said to be Christ instead of Apollo. Now, there was a panegyric written about the Apollo claim, which is in T.D. Barnes. I'm, hopefully you've heard of T.D. Barnes. He's a famous Roman historian. <clears throat> and I can, I've documented it in the Pauline stuff, so I'm not going to document it here. But the point I'm trying to say is this text, is covering Constantine's rise. And what does it say? It's the beginning of birth pangs. Birth pangs for what? Then they will deliver you over to tribulation. This is how the Lord himself is characterizing Constantine himself. See, because 283, by the end of it, is 313. That's after the Battle of Melvin Bridge. That's the Edict of Toleration. That, that, you know, Constantine and Licinius, because Licinius was another, you know, heir apparent, because Galerian died in 310. Galerian, Galerius, rather, dies right here, Tauta. Except the Tauta is abridged, yeah, because Galerius died, like, suddenly. It's something that's like worms. Tautarche. Yeah, the beginning of his birth pains <laughs> happened in 310. So we got, you got 305, 6, 7, 8, yeah, 8, 9, 10. So at the beginning of our king was the beginning of his death. Okay, <laughs> cute. Galerius is not well <clears throat> attested there. This is the word for birth pains. Okay? And Odion, see? Odinon, ho, o, di, non. Three years. Okay? And that's Constantine having his own power at that point. Defeating Maxenius' son. Okay? Defeating Maxenius, rather. Okay? <clears throat> and there, uh, there's a whole bunch of history that happens during this time, which I covered already in the Pauline videos on Constantine. But the point here is that the Lord is characterizing Constantine's time as bad. Christianity, of course, does not do that. Because Christianity doesn't know what the Bible says and doesn't care. What is, what, what is Constantine known for? Unifying church and state. What does the Bible warn against? Unifying church and state. So here, and then, tote, paradosusin. They will deliver, who? You. Over to, ice means into, with reference to, flipsin. Tribulation. And that's exactly what Constantine's reign was. So they were argued this Constantine himself is going to die in 337 on Pentecost, okay? So this phrase is ending at 295. So 295 plus 30 is 325. Constantine's not dead yet. 325 is what? Well, if you paid any attention to history, that's the Council of Nicaea. Signified by flip scene. Right here. That's a condemnation of it. I hope you get that satire wit. Okay. And then. And. They will kill you. Believers. Killing believers. Yeah. And that ends by. See, any syllable 303, 303 plus 30 
It's 333, four years before Constantine dies. Yeah, and if you go up, look up the laws that were passed under Constantine. Okay? There were a whole bunch of laws against the heretics and against Jews. And they started rounding them up and killing them using the very same model that, that our boy Diocletian used in 304 A.D., way back up here, remember? Everything Diocletian did, Constantine just slapped a Christian name on it and repeated it. It's been going on ever since. Okay? This is why we went into the Dark Ages. And they will kill you. See? Then they will deliver you over to tribulation. The authorities. And they will kill you. That's exactly what happened under Constantine. If you didn't go along with it, with the little Council of Nicaea, you were deemed a heretic, and you got killed, your property confiscated, your Bible destroyed, because after all, you were a heretic, so your Bible couldn't be any good. And that's kind of how the, that's how the Catholic Church got started. Right there. Political Church. Revelation 17 Harlot in New Rome, Constantine's Rome, which we call Constantinople, but he called it New Rome when he founded it, replete with seven hills that he reconstructed to model after Old Rome. Of course, it's now called Istanbul today, and it's Islamic. Ooh, and the guy who's running it is making noises like he wants to be a messiah. Except it's anti-Israel Messiah. Guy names er Erdogan, they call him. I would call it Erdogan, but they on TV they call him, they pronounce the G like a W. Okay. Now Wally Shubat maintains, all oh, it's Islam that's referenced in Revelation 17. Well, geographically perhaps. But fake church is the theme of the Bible. So somewhere in the future, perhaps, political Christianity, which is the pro-life, disgusting, pro-life, disgusting, awful, antichrist group, which is the majority of Christians today, they're so stupid they can't tell how Donald Trump is a jerk. They want power so badly they'll even unite with him. And Ted Cruz is the same group. Okay, it's called Dominionism now. It's the latest Pope flavor of the Protestants. Okay, Catholics just got more, you know, competing. Everybody wants to be a Pope. Okay, so they want power so bad they might even do a deal with Islam. And this is all being focused on here with Constantine. Now here, they will kill you. That's 333 A.D. Constantine dies four years later. Kai Eseste. Kai Eseste. Four syllables. Four years. That's when he dies. Hating and that's exactly what his sons did. Within, by he dies on Pentecost. By September, his hating sons—that's the word for hating in Greek. Misumenoi, misumenoi, misumenoi. According to their accent marks, but I don't agree with their accent marks. Misumenoi. All right. Their hating sons were destroying their own family to wipe out any rivals. Okay? And then they turned on each other. And by 360 AD, about 362, none of the sons will be left. And they don't have kids. Remember fourth generation curse? And look at the text. And you will be hated by everybody in all the nations because of my name. 
Yeah. They were fighting civil wars with each other over the entire Roman Empire, but this, this part of it ends at 354 A.D. Over his name, in his name. One of the sons says, oh, Jesus is part of the Trinity, and the other one says, no, Jesus is just the God by one person. One of them says, oh, Jesus isn't really God, and the other one says, well, Jesus is God and man, and they all go to war over that. And you know who fought in those wars, don't you? You're my ancestors. Anybody who's a Christian who didn't go along with this. Anybody who did go along with this. We all go back to Noah, okay? They fought wars. Dia can mean because of. Okay? It's used, here it's used with the genitive, so it's, it's you know, through conduit kind of idea. Because of my name, on account of my name, through, dia means through, through my name, through. So anybody trying to claim that there's no church referenced in Revelation 17 isn't paying very close attention to the text. And of course that is the traditional interpretation, okay, which Wally Shubat ignores. And shouldn't because this is the start of a long standing, this whole thing here, focusing on Constantine. The Lord is saying that right here, really pretty baldly when you look at the history. Paul elaborates on it in Ephesians 1 3 through 14. I already did the Vimeo videos on that. Paul Meter GGS 11 channel in Vimeo, line by line, syllable by syllable. The history is all plotted out and you can check it yourself. And then Luke 21 is also metering to this. And we've got that discussion going on in Frank Forum right now, including this Matthew 24 stuff. And on top of that, John linked, uh, Peter linked to Paul to make a song out of the Pauline Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 text. So he's elaborating on it. And then John elaborates on Paul and Peter. Book of Hebrews also elaborates on it. And John elaborates on them all, starting in Revelation 1. And by Revelation 17, which is probably metered, but I haven't parsed it yet. The word mystery for church, that's Paul's term. So mystery doesn't mean Islam. It means church. Now maybe it's Chrislam. Because political church is so hungry for power. In the name of God, okay, in the name of God, they'll even unite with Islam. Pope's already doing that. Pope's already saying, well, you know, the, the Islam, the Muslims are probably saved if they do good deeds. Ah, uh, no. So, you know what, expect the Pradis to go in the same direction. Okay, they want power so badly they don't even care about their own alleged doctrines. As long as they can get the you know White House, that's all they care about. God doesn't mean anything to them. So why wouldn't it become Chrislam if that'll give them power? So this is the forecast of the future. Okay, and then of course he goes on after that, and everybody's going to be offended. Okay, and. They're going to hand each other over because and hate each other, okay? And they're going to lie, these false prophets. I mean, it just goes on and on. And this is exactly the history of Rome. And Paul traces it up to uh, 430, 434, so it'd be about the 400 mark. But he's not matching it exactly here. He's sandwiching his text elsewhere and then matching it. See, 434 before 04. Okay, so it's just, it's like here, just after here, um, seven more syllables, eight more syllables. So, ho de hupo menes. Menas. Ho de hupo menas. Okay, that's only six. Es telos. Just it's gonna take nine. Ho da hupo 
Poda hupo menas es telos. So it's going through nine to go to the end of telos. Okay. He who endures to the end. Hupo meno means to endure, to go under, to stand under. Literally it means to stand under. Meno means to abide. Hupo means under. So you abide under what? Bible doctrine, duh. He who endures to the end. This isn't about being saved to heaven. This is about being saved from the upcoming destruction. This one will be saved from the upcoming destruction. This doesn't mean salvation to heaven. Okay, Book of Hebrews plays on this particular verse. Okay, throughout. But especially in chapter 11 and 10. Okay? So Christ is basically warning you, Hi! By the time you reach 441 A.D., you better be out of Rome. Especially New Rome, which is Istanbul. In other words, you better be out of Anatolia. And people who were counting their syllables in order to memorize scripture in those days would have understood this. I wish our ancestors had taught us to do that because then it would be really easy to explain and memorize scripture now, but it isn't. Because they didn't pass it down. Because they were disinterested. He who endures to the end will be saved. Yeah, because what happens by 441 AD is that the, the religious crowd gets full control over, over the Gauls, over Britain, over the, the Anatolia, over Jerusalem. Okay, that's its wide, that it reaches a really wide extent then. And at the same time, you have a setup for the disintegration of the West, which occurs under Odovacher in 476, which of course is therefore depicted next. 476, Odovacher, that's when you have the start of actual nation states growing in the West, minus 30. It's 446. Okay, so see that is starting to be depicted right here. And it's really interesting how this is told. Look at this. And to be a witness to all the people's nations. And then comes the end. Okay, we'll see. Toy set nation. That was the nickname for the Western barbarians by the Romans. Okay, the Western barbarians took over Rome. Okay, this is what's so hysterical about it. See, 446 is the mark of taking over the West. So you got, you want um, 37 to 46 is 9. So we got 9 syllables. Es marturion pasin Tois et nesin. So you got actually ten. Maybe he's rounding my fiscal years. Because the, the Jewish fiscal year either starts at the autumnal or the vernal equinox. Es marturion pasin tois et nesin. Yeah, and the, the et nesin right here. Et et nesin. You can say et et ne. Et ne means nation anyhow. Sin. Okay. To the nations. The, the nations took over Rome at that point. See the satire? Now, and then comes the end. Yeah, it becomes the end of the, the you know, the, the breakup of the Roman Empire. So it's got a dual entendre there. Not necessarily the end of time, but the end of the Roman Empire. Because then the Western Roman Empire breaks up into nations starting at that point. Okay, so it's really kind of hysterical how well the scripture satirizes actual history, but its focus, honey, is on apostate church that goes apostate under Constantine, who took it from Diocletian to persecute Christians. Right all in here. It just keeps going on and on and on, and then it dies right here. That's the Constantinian legacy. Christians persecuting Christians right in front of you in black. 
So you can't just say it's Islam and the Bible doesn't talk about Islam directly. So it's blaming the church, not Islam. Think about it, yell at me. The video description will have links to where we've got this conversation going on in Frank Forum.